Welcome to Lavender U, a community for LGBTQ plus women and femmes, where we talk about all things queer media and representation. I'm Jamie Margolin, and today on the pod, we have Pigeon Pagonis. Pigeon Pagonis is an intersex activist, filmmaker, public speaker, YouTuber, and soon-to-be author. Before watching their content, I had never heard of what being intersex was, and their videos opened my eyes and educated me about the community and the issues they face, so much so that I included Pigeon in my book, Youth to Power, Your Voice and How to Use It. Pigeon, welcome to the pod. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much. (laughs) Yes. So tell us a little bit about yourself, um, who you are and what you do. Man, it's hard when you say a little bit about myself. Not a little, um, a lot. It can be, it can be all of it. A lot of bit too? Okay. okay tell tell okay. us a lot a bit about yourself. Oh, well, well, I, uh, my name is Pigeon. I was born in Chicago, born and raised, still live there. Um, I'm a Pisces. I use non-binary pronouns, they, them, and any pronouns is fine though, but preference is they, them. Um, I'm 35. I have a toy poodle. His name is Jerry. And I was born intersex. And intersex is a cool ass word. No, it's not that cool. But it's a word for people with cool bodies that don't fit neatly into the binary. Um, And I do my work around intersex justice. And yeah, like you said, I'm writing a book right now. Yeah, I think that's a lot about me. So for people who are listening to this podcast and do not know what intersex is, what is intersex? And um, what would you say to someone who, who has never heard about this before? to our listeners. Yeah, intersex is the most amazing way to be born a human being. It is like the statue, if you think of the Greek statues and the Greek gods, Hermaphrodite, Hermes and Aphrodite combining into one perfect human being with parts of both Hermes and Aphrodite. Um, It's a person with a body that blurs the boundaries of male and female, just how they're born. And the main issue with being born intersex has nothing to do with the intersex person, but the society that we're born into um, and the stigma that's in our society around bodies that don't conform, uh, whether in gender expression or in our case, biological sex and uh, expression. And that, that problem is, is like the oppression and the violence and the discrimination that happens to people that are not fitting neatly into a binary. Um, And specifically with intersex people, it comes down to decades upon decades of really grotesque, um, violent repression of the ways our bodies are naturally born. And they use um, surgical techniques, forced hormone administration and secrecy And that's all bottled up in this cute other part of society called shame. So all of that works together, the surgery, the forced hormones, the secrecy and lies, and then the shame and the stigma to really uh, strip intersex people of their basic human rights, especially their bodily autonomy. So that's the kind of definition I just gave you. Other people will just say, or textbook definition is just like a person born with sex characteristics that can't be neatly identified as completely male or completely female. And this shows up in 1.7% of the human population. But it's more important to me to talk about the positives. Like we are happy and healthy the way we are born. We are beautiful the way we are born. And it's more important to highlight the atrocities that are done to us at the hands of non-intersex people who are usually surgeons, you know, who are surgeons um, and the society at large that that we exist in. Yeah. Yeah. Society often feels the need to quote unquote fix um, people who don't fit into the gender binary, you know, queer people, there's conversion therapy. And I guess this is an almost extreme version where it's like a surgical conversion. Um, And so institutions are constantly trying to control silence and, essentially try to fix what isn't broken because um, people who are queer, who are gender queer, who are intersex, who are in the LGBTQIA spectrum in any way are not broken. But um, 
and, and are born the way the way we are, but Q Lady Gaga institutions. Q Lady Gaga. Um Q Lady Gaga. I was born this way. But unfortunately institutions don't don't value um or see that especially with, with, with intersex folks. So what is your your story of how did you like find out you were intersex and um was it kept a, a secret from you or was there any shame initially because now it's so wonderful to hear you say like you're like this is the most beautiful way to be born like there's so much pride and um confidence in your identity was it always that way or did you what what was your journey in, in coming to terms with with who you are and and loving yourself despite a society that is pushing all of these medical practices that that try to make people ashamed of who they are yeah i love this question um no, I was not always like this. Um, and how I found out was in layers. Um, the first time I found out anything about my body related to intersex and in, related to it being intersex was when I was like six years old. And my mom had a conversation with me and let me know that I couldn't, when I grew up, I wouldn't be able to have a period like her um, or my aunt or my grandma or whatever. And she said it was because when I was born, the doctors found cancer in my ovaries and they had to rush to save my life and remove my ovaries. And that as a result, I would not be able to have a period. And as a result of not being able to have a period and not having ovaries, I would not be able to have biological children like in my stomach that I could give birth to. And then she told me about the possibility for adoption. So I grew up thinking I was a cancer survivor, an ovarian cancer survivor <laughs> for a very long time. Um, and then the next thing that happened that was related, but again, I wasn't told the truth, was this time I was having an issue with using the bathroom. I would go to pee in a bathroom and sit down at the toilet to pee. And afterwards, after I stood up, after I peed, I would feel a little pee come out of me, like into my underwear. And I told my mom, like, hey, this keeps happening and it's kind of annoying. It wasn't like a huge amount of pee, but it was still annoying. And one thing led to another and I was in the hospital. I was uh, scheduled for a doctor's appointment and then they scheduled me for a... Uh, exploratory procedure where they stuck a camera up my vagina is what I called it back then <laughs> and um, they looked around with the camera and they came out and they said okay your bladder and your urethra has an issue and we need to go in and fix your urethra because it's like the curvature of it is trapping the urine and that's why it's um, coming out when you stand up or whatever and I was like weird but okay and then they did a surgery they said it was on my bladder and everything. Um, but before the surgery, they were prepping me. I remember these doctors came in and they were like, hey, we noticed during your exploratory procedure that your vagina is a little bit smaller than you know normal. So when we're in there doing your bladder surgery and your urethra surgery, um, we're just going to make it a little bit bigger, you know, your vagina. It's like a circle and we're just going to make a small incision and make the circle a little bit wider. So like when you're married and you want to like make babies with your husband, I was like 11 at this point. So I don't know what language they were using, but they talked about a husband and sex in whatever way they did. And they were like, you'll be able to have, you know, that, that experience and you'll be knocked out. You won't feel a thing. You'll already be under for surgery. Is that okay? And I was like, okay. And so, but you were a child. I was 10 and a half, um, mm. maybe 11. I think I was 10 and a half. Um, so then, and again, they didn't say the word intersex or anything. Um, so then around that same time, I got put on hormones. So I was like 11 or 10 again. And I can't remember if it was before that procedure or after, but they told me because my cancerous ovaries were taken out. That in order to go through puberty, I need to take these pills. And these pills would replace the hormones that my ovaries would have normally made. I said, okay, whatever. You know, everyone's going through puberty in school. And I'll take these pills. And they said, and don't tell anyone you take these pills. Because, you know, kids like to talk. And you don't want rumors. And 
these are your private info. This is your private information. It's your body. It's your privacy. And so they're like, being very okay. hush hush and strange. Very. And it's their protocol. I later found out like it's in the textbooks to do exactly what they said to me and my parents and to me. Um, they think it's best. Well, they used to. I don't know today. They're a little bit different, but they used to think it's best to not tell the kid anything like the truth. They like to give you small doses of what they think you can handle, um, which is like lie about ovarian cancer because they think if you find out you're intersex that you'll just like kill yourself because, ah, um, or at least that's what they pretend to say. That's what they pretend to think, or at least that's the reason they use for their rationale of what they do to us or to support the rationale. So they're being very hush hush and I don't really know anything that's going on except I had a weird pee problem and now they're telling me my vagina is smaller than usual and don't tell anybody about the pills and don't tell anyone you had cancer in your ovaries no one needs to know that but your husband one day mm-hmm. so I'm like okay um and then the next weird thing is when I first tried to have sex and there was nothing you know besides checkups where they would check in between my legs every six months and make sure I was healing after the surgery and taking my pills and my boobs, make sure my boobs were growing enough for their happiness with the pills. And now I'm 16, I get a boyfriend and we try to have sex for the first time and it does, his penis doesn't fit inside of my vagina. And it like, whatever we tried, it just wasn't working. So then we tried again on a different day and it didn't work again. And so I think it took like three different days of trying and finally it went in, his penis went inside. And it hurt like hell. And it, I bled. And I thought, oh, that must be my cherry popping. Um, or my hymen popping. And then I thought, okay, it's going to hurt the first time, but maybe it'll get better. And then it just never felt good. Nothing about sex ever felt good. And it just went from being painful experience to very numbing. Or just feeling numb during the experience. So then... Now I'm like in high school and I'm getting pretty sad about life and depressed and angry and I'm using a lot of alcohol and um, smoking a lot of weed to black out um, as much as I can and in order to experience sex because it was such an uncomfortable experience for me. I usually had to be really fucked up to do that and I thought I had to do that to be normal, like to have sex with my boyfriend. Mm. Because my doctors kept telling me, like, you're normal. Everything's normal. And I was like, okay, mm-hmm. I'm normal. Let me let me make this clear to myself and everyone else that I'm normal. I can have sex with a boy. And I'm straight. And I'm in this relationship and whatever. Um, then I go to college. And that's a big thing for me because no one in my family has gone to a four-year university. Um, oh, wow. And I'm the first person, you know, and I'm like... Yeah. Da, 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 da. I'm gonna go to college, get my First life. Gen. Yes. I was gonna be a veterinarian. I wanted to be. And then I ended up not being one. And um <laughs> I was gonna go to this big school in the south southern central Illinois called University of Illinois. But mm-hmm. I changed my mind like two months before school started and I went to a school in Chicago, which is where I lived. Um but it was more downtown, it was kind of like farther. It was like maybe a thirty minute drive from my house. But it felt like a different world. Like where I lived was like the edge of the city. And this was like in the middle of everything, like downtown, like blah, blah, blah. And I knew about this school because the children's hospital I went to my whole life was across the street from the college. It's called Lurie. And it used to be across the street from my college, which was called DePaul University. And one day I'm sitting in a psychology of women class, 400 level or 300, whatever, as a first year, and because, you know, I didn't know anything about college, I signed up for a senior level, 300 level course because I didn't know what the numbers meant. And I just like the title, Psychology of Women. Cool. And the teacher ends up being trans, a trans woman, and knew about intersex. So one of the course days or one of the class days, she taught us about intersex, which I had never heard of before. I had heard the term hermaphrodite, but I had never heard the word intersex and knew anything about intersex. I just thought hermaphrodites were like freaky sideshow people that didn't really exist and statues in ancient Greece or whatever. Um, But she she specifically talked about one intersex variation because there's a bunch. 
but she talked about one called androgen insensitivity syndrome because I think she used it as an example because these these people with AIS, people with AIS um, tend to be described as super and hyper feminine in their body, mm. in their external body appearance, and then internally masculine traits like being born with undescended testes, for instance, and no uterus and no ovaries and no cervix, but also being born with a vagina, a vaginal canal that's blind ending, to use their words, and narrow and small. And another signifying trait, again, with like the hyper feminine description is that they don't usually have body hair in terms of like pubic hair, underarm hair and under, yeah, I said pubic and underarm hair. So a lot of like, um, and they don't generally have like hairy legs and like stuff like that. So it's like, they're like what people like to Photoshop women to look like the ideal feminine appearance in our country at this time. Like they're kind of born looking like that because they're androgen insensitive. So no androgens register in their body, even though they were born with testes that produce androgens like testosterone. But um, their body converts all those androgens into estrogen. And so women who don't have AIS or people that don't have AIS, like cis women generally have androgens plus estrogen. So they have a balance or a mix. But these people who have XY chromosomes, who have undescended testes, have zero androgen response and so they become quote unquote hyper feminine or whatever so she's teaching us about this in a psychology of women class i think to kind of show the like breadth and depth of women and different experiences and um i felt this like weird feeling in my body because the slide also mentioned that they don't get a period and um but i was like but i'm like maybe that's what I have, but I don't have XY chromosomes. Like I'm a girl. I just graduated from an all girl Catholic high school. I'm dating a boy. Like we're heterosexual. We're straight. I play hmm. on all girls traveling fast pitch softball team my whole life and um, never been questioned. You know, I've never, no one has ever been like, sir or anything, you know? So I have this like little, this little moment in that classroom where I'm like, this could be me, <laughs> but I'm like, but I don't have XY chromosomes. And I was not born with testes. Hello. I was born with cancerous ovaries. So, but the feeling like kind of just would linger. It's like, no, I think this is talking about you or whatever. So I go mm. home because I'm 18 now. And my mom got a letter from the children's hospital across the street from my college that said, oh, your child's 18. This is a children's hospital. You need to find them an adult hospital to go to. We can't see them anymore. Um, we recommend they see a gynecologist for adults, blah, 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 blah. And like discharge papers maybe or something. And I had known my mom got that, but I didn't read them or anything because I was at college. So I called her and I said, mom, open those papers from the college, please. And do they say anything like like um, a description of like, is there a word for anything about my body, like a like a diagnosis? So she goes to her drawer, her sock drawer, where she keeps all her important papers <laughs> next to her bras and panties and socks and social security card. And then she pulls out this paper and she starts looking through them and I can hear through the phone. She's like shuffling the papers and she ends up saying androgen and sensitivity syndrome. And I felt, I felt so shocked mm -hmm. and like, I didn't know what the fuck was going on. I was like, what? This means I have XY chromosomes. Like, I'm a boy. Like, and no one told me what the fuck. Like, is this why they take I take these pills? Because I was really supposed to be a boy. And I remember, like, at some point, this, like, at that point, when I found that out, I remember pulling my hair, which was this long at the time, but it wasn't blue. Mm. And I pulled it back, like, um, slicked it back with my hands. And I was looking in the mirror, like, trying to see, like, am I a boy? Like, is this... Like, trying to see what I look like without, like, the feminine, like, attribute of long, wavy hair. And so, I just spiraled. And then, eventually, I told my teacher the next week, or, like, some point in office hours, I said, you know that thing you taught us about AIS? I found out I have that thing. And she said, well, um, thank you for telling me. And... We have a speaker coming to class this week or next week, and they're intersex. 
would you like me to arrange you to get pizza with them after and meet them? Or, yeah, I think, she, yeah, she said they're intersex. And I said, okay, th- thank you. And so that speaker came and told their story, and then I got to meet them. And they asked me, have you said you're intersex yet? And I said, no, because I was ashamed. This kind of gets that other question of, like, my mm. journey. And I was like, no, yeah. like, no, <laughs> I'm a normal girl, which is the right. name of my film. <laughs> and so I was like, no, like, I haven't. And they're like, well, you need to say it. And I was like, I don't want to. They're like, say it. And I'm like on campus. I'm near campus at a pizza place in public, mm. kind of. And and uh, I'm like, no, I don't want my college friends. I don't want anyone to know that I'm intersex. Like, I still see it as like this freakish thing. And I don't even want right. to be associated with it. But the person is like very dominant. So I was like, okay. I'll do it. And I was like, I'm intersex. And they're like, say it louder. And I'm like, okay, I'm intersex. And then they're like, okay, now you got to get your medical records. So they told me how to get my medical records. And one day I went across the street to the college and applied, paid, you know, paid money in the room where they have all the medical records and asked for my records to be copied. And it took like six weeks to a few months, but I finally got them. And that was this, if I was shocked when I heard I was AIS, when I, if, if I was shocked when I heard that I had AIS, it didn't come close to what I felt reading the documents, the medical doc, the medical records. Um, because in those records, I found out all the things they did to me um, at the age of one and at the age of four and at the age of 11 when I was supposedly under anesthesia for a bladder surgery. Um, and it just, it really killed me, like, to read what they did to me in my body. Um, so throughout all of this, you were, you're in, in well into your college years by the time that you actually discovered that you were intersex. And so throughout all of this time, I know you said you had a boyfriend and you felt like, oh, I'm a normal girl. Like, I went to a all-girls high school. I also went to an all-girls high school. Um <laughs> Uh, it, it's it was yours catholic yeah mine too even though i'm jewish very interesting <laughs> yeah uh, i was i was a, <laughs> i was a gay jew at a at a catholic school it was it was, it was a time it was a time sounds um, great <laughs> <laughs> well actually my school was very liberal compared to most catholic schools but anyway that's not the point that's a story for another time but what i'm saying <laughs> is throughout all of this were you ever like were you like, I am heterosexual and I'm just a, a cis straight person? Or was there ever a part of yourself that was like questioning or just felt like LGBT or queer in any way? So growing up, I was called a tomboy by my family and just mm. like known pretty much by everyone. But my family would always just be like, oh, there's such a tomboy. Um, And I was like, OK, like I love the representations of tomboys that I saw in media, like in movies mm-hmm. and films and TV shows. And so I was like, yeah, that's what I am. Like, I love sports and I love playing the types of games that boys like to play in the yard like or in the alley. Like, we like to play sports in the alley and stuff or wrestling or whatever. I was really into WWF wrestling and baseball and basketball and softball and roller hockey and just like everything that the boys in the neighborhood did. Um but throughout that, I was still pretty boy crazy, like thinking boys were hot as hell. And like, you know, I was like having crushes on boys. And I think because and I think also I would have these like obsessions with girls, like friends or girls that I thought were like so beautiful and like hot. But like I would in my head, I was just like, oh, my God, I'm so jealous of them. I want to be like mm. them. I want to look like them. Or, like, I want to be their best friend. But I didn't have, like, the language or the experience to know. But that's not really a reason because some people just know. But I didn't have, like, a crush. I didn't know, like, I was having a crush on girls. And I wasn't, like, hiding it or anything. Like, I didn't feel like I had to hide it. I just felt like I was into boys. And also, like, I thought girls were so cute. I I thought girls ruled. I was like, girls rule. I'm so glad I was born a girl. Like, uh, boys are, like, disgusting. And, like, I'm so glad I'm not that. And I could be a girl and, like... 
you know, like do cool things that girls get to do. I saw girls as having like privilege for some reason. <laughs> like us hmm. is like, we can grow our hair out and look and wear makeup and look beautiful. And like, they have to just wear stupid, boring, short haircuts and never get to wear makeup. I don't know. I was just like, girls are the shit. And um, yeah. But I still like was like by fifth, sixth grade, I had like crushes on boys. I was dating boys and stuff. And when I got to college, that's an interest. Oh, and then in high school, I was boy crazy. I dated this boy from freshman year of college to freshman year. I mean, freshman year of high school till freshman year of college. And I was like fifth grade when I met my boyfriend, a different boyfriend. I was like, mom, I found the guy I'm marrying. And then the next boyfriend, I was like, I found the next guy I'm marrying. Then this guy in high school was like, I'm marrying him. And I was just like <laughs> a serial dater. And serial monogamous serial monogamy and just like marrying everybody I was just like that's just what I'm gonna do um and then in college I saw these queer kids on campus like they were in the student center by the cafe and I could tell they were queer just like by their haircuts and their Tegan and Sarah t-shirts and the, way uh, they the Tegan and Sarah t-shirts do give it away <laughs> yeah and there was like mohawks and there was like all the telltale signs of like early two thousand, mid two thousands. Uh, I don't know when I was in college, but uh, the 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 college the two thousand look for lesbians and queer people and trans people, and so like they had all those markers, and I didn't really understand what I was looking at, but I felt this like this longing to be a part of their like circle of friends, but also this shame at the same time, like oh my god, I can't let anyone like see me be with them, or like or I can't express that desire that I want to be with them be friends with them because like I only had straight friends and I thought they would be like homophobic um but yeah so and also I uh I grew up in a pretty homophobic like environment Mm. so it was just kind of like like if if any of us kids kind of stepped out of like gender boundaries we got like made fun of and so especially for like boys but like me I was, they were constantly on me about I was worse than the boys in my family because my room was messy or I didn't like to take showers all the time and brush my hair. And so there was always this this like comparison to me when whenever I was too boyish. And so and also like people in my family were just not they don't hide the fact that they like make fun of people that are gay like growing up. Mm. So I think I was very scared to ever like express feelings of like maybe I'm queer or anything but also I think I just didn't know um and so then I'm in college I finally break up with that boy (laughs) and this like butch lesbian in my sociology class starts like hanging out with me and we start hanging out and I start noticing myself like wearing taking showers before I hang out with them and putting perfume on and like doing my makeup and hair and I'm like what am I doing? And I was just like, I don't know. I'm just going to go hang out with a friend, quote unquote. And then um, then I'm in there. They're in bed with me and we're cuddling and then they're kissing me and I'm kissing them. And then we dated for like two years and I'm like, I'm marrying this person. And then <laughs> so that that just kind of happened. And like, I didn't ever have a moment, though, where I felt like I was in the closet. Um, it just kind of was like a natural progression after I found that I was intersex. That was about a year later that I met that person. And she kind of was, a, she was the first person I told that I was intersex and all the shit they did to me. And so we did trauma, like lesbian trauma bonding. And mm. it made us very close to each other. And also they're naturally like a very gifted listener. And um, that's when I started identifying. They taught me the word queer. They said they were queer and they explained it to me as saying, if you look at the light bulbs on the fan on the ceiling, there's three light bulbs. And that light bulb has, if that light turns on, that one is like lesbian and that one is gay and that one is bisexual. And if you turn on all the lights at once, that all the light together is queer. And Mm -hmm. it means that I love people's hearts and not their body parts. And I was like, oh, I, I like that. I'm queer too, because I had so much shame about my body, which I had just found out a year ago Mm -hmm. after reading my medical records. Um, And so that was my first experience with queerness. And then I ended up, because she was friends with that group of people that I saw in the cafeteria before, the queer students, Mm. I ended up like meeting them and becoming friends with them and joining like the clubs that they were in, like the feminist group and the, I don't know, and joining women and gender studies eventually and stuff like that. Um, And so that's kind of like how like queerness happened, my journey to queerness. (laughs) That's but also beautiful. it's an interesting question because like what is straight for someone like me and what is queer 
and also yeah. I identify as non-binary, which is also complicated because some people would say I'm cisgender because non-binary and I have like, and I'm intersex. So some people would say that's cis because intersex people who are non-binary are kind of cis. And I'm like, I get it on a scientific technical level, but also it's not like your lived reality. Like if you're non-binary, you're non-binary. Um, I just like, I like thinking about that stuff sometimes. Identity is is complicated, and I feel like that's why you know when when we talk about the rainbow, um, it, that's why it's it's a rainbow. A lot of people fit into so many different categories, and there are so many. It's not black and white in terms of identity, in terms of gender. So it took you so much time and and trauma and to to come to terms with who you were. All of these things were done to you against your consent by medical professionals who weren't doing it out of like medical need. It was out of cosmetic cosmetic not need but it was just like this child should conform to what we think should happen boom we're gonna normalize literally yeah. normalize you without even asking your consent and you couldn't yeah. consent because you were a child yeah and so now you you you've been on the cover of national geographic you've been in buzzfeed videos you have a memoir coming out you have a youtube channel you've done a video with kehlani like you're <laughs> you're you're popping like you're you're out here like really bringing so much awareness to the community and like and all of your, your social media presence as well. You're doing all of these campaigns and features and things like that. So representation truly saves lives because seeing someone who is like you in the media, um, it makes you feel less alone. It makes you feel validated. It makes you feel good in your identity. And I know that you're that for a lot of intersex folks through the art that you make, through the films that you make, through the YouTube videos you film and the social media campaigns that you do. So... For people who, who are not familiar with your work, like um, how would you identify yourself as an artist and a filmmaker, and and what what was the process of of making um, of turning into the the pigeon that that everyone knows and and loves that that is like this this intersex icon, hatching into the pigeon, you can say hatching into um, the pigeon, yes. <laughs> um, I think I would categorize myself as like a a dabbler. I like to dabble in different forms of media and art. I'm not really like a pro at any of them or anything, but since I was a kid, I've always liked photography. Um, my grandpa had a camera and he didn't like let me touch it or nothing, but <laughs> he was mean. But I, I really would just stare at his camera and just like want to look at, like be on the other end of it, like looking through it. And like, mm. I was just so entranced by cameras. And then my, I remember my cousin's dad had a camera and he let me take a picture once at my cousin's graduation of him like a film camera it was like and I just felt like like that the heavens opened up and I was like oh like this is what I want to hold for the rest of my life like I want to put my eye through this thing and you know I didn't know anything about photography but I was just like I love this experience so I, I remember I had like very early digital cameras I would buy them like they had like they had like less than one megapixel and they were so horrible. And I would take pictures of my bearded dragons and make websites on GeoCities for them and be like, welcome to Bentley's page, Bentley the bearded dragon. And then I'd have like a digital picture I took of them. And it was like, I was just like kind of always into photos and posting things before like nice. it became social media and stuff. And um, and then in, after college uh, or in college, I actually started my college courses in digital cinema, taking film classes and screenwriting mm -hmm. and editing. And I took a and I, I, I quickly left that field because this was back in the day when shit was really hard to do. Like it was like we were using physical tapes, mini tapes, oh. mini DV, and then we would have to transfer it digitally to a computer and it was using Avid before Final Cut Pro and 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 the other thing that Adobe whatever it's called. And Avid would crash every two seconds and like you would lose all your footage. And it was just like it was so technically difficult to be a film student back then at a school that didn't really have it was a beginning film program so they didn't have really great stuff but I learned the basics of editing and I learned the basics of storytelling and screen screenwriting from amazing teachers mm. and we watched amazing films and kind of analyzed them and there was this one film that kind of changed my life he took us on a field trip to see it at a very beautiful theater called Music Box in Chicago um it's old-fashioned and the, the, the film was called Tarnation and it was produced by a queer man named Jonathan Cowett from New York City, or he was in New York City at the time. And he's, his boyfriend had an iMac, those colorful ones back in the day, the mm. clear big ones with the colors. And it had iMovie. And he made his documentary about his life for like $350. 
about growing up, um, being queer, but also having a mother with mental illness and how that affected him. He documented his life since he was a kid with video. Oh, wow. And then he put it all together as a queer adult in his boyfriend's iMac, on his boyfriend's iMac, and it got picked up and distributed. But my teacher kept telling us, like, this was made with $300 and iMac iMovie. Like, that means you can make a film. He kept drilling that into our heads. Like, there is no limit. You should not have, like, a limit in your head. Like, oh, I need millions of dollars. He's like, look at this film. It was amazing. The music was really good, too. It was really emotional. And it sat with me for decades, like, years. I loved that film. And I, it's, it inspired me to make my first film, which was called The Son I Never Had. And that mm. was something I made in graduate school as a thesis project, instead of writing a traditional paper, I had to write a shorter paper. And also I got to make a film because Women in Gender Studies was generous enough to say you could have a creative thesis project instead of a traditional essay. And so I made that film. It's a, it's a lot of archival footage that I have from when I found that I was intersex. I would, I would record my mom on um, my phone. I would open up my, or my laptop. I would open up QuickTime and click start recording. I put my phone on speakerphone and then I would have these conversations with my mom when I was just finding out everything. Um, Sometimes she would leave me voicemails when we weren't talking and I would record them. I would talk to just, I actually just, it was at a point in my life where I recorded everything. I recorded the train conductor. I would talk to him. I would talk to anybody on the street. I would just record sounds, people. I was just really into recording audio. And like six or seven or eight or nine, 10 years later, I'm in grad school and I was able to use all that footage a lot of that footage for this like film I made, which again, zero budget, just like Tarnation, used my iPod headphones as my microphone and recording device, and then just kind of spoke into a microphone, like my narrative, and then added that to the film because it was supposed to be a radio piece at first, like a like a like a podcast kind of. But then mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I like adding images. Like I love adding images to sounds. Like it's like one of my favorite things. And so it became like a quasi documentary. And that was my first foray into like intersex or into filmmaking. And it was about growing up intersex. Mm. Um, yeah. I don't know. If that and then you the also. Yeah, no, that is answering the question. And, and OK, cool. Also, uh, how how did you like. You said you had another film called Normal Girl. Did you make a, a second normal girl? Film? Yeah. A normal girl? Yeah, so I used to uh, travel around and share that first film when I would give talks at colleges. And someone in the audience in a school in Oregon contacted me, a professor there, and was a young professor. And she was like, hey, I, ha- I know a director person that films stuff. And we want to make a film with you. We like loved, I loved The Sun I Never Had. And um, would you want to make a film with us? And I was like, will you do all the work? And they were like, yes. I was like, I'm in. And they're like, so that became A Normal Girl, which is a short and it's distributed online through Women Make Films. Um, And that's more professionally polished, like documentary with like talking heads and people speaking. My mom is in it. Well, my mom's in both, but her face is in this. Like she's speaking to the camera. She knows she's in it because first one, she don't know she's in. My dad don't know he's in. Like I just recorded them and put all that shit together. On the first film. But this is a more traditional documentary, short documentary. And it's really great. And I don't, I want to get it out there like for free or just so people can get it easier. Because I think right now it's just for institutional purchase. That sounds amazing. And how was it like finally getting to like tell your story? And then like now you got on the cover of National Geographic. Like how did it transition from you taking this film that that you made very hands-on and giving presentations to colleges about it and raising awareness about folks like you to now you have this very large social media presence. You made a video with Kehlani. You're in BuzzFeed. You're on the cover of Nat Geo. You have a memoir coming out. And and, and people look to you as, as representation, as, as like a, a leader in the community. How did uh, how did that happen for you? Like what's your ascent, I suppose? Um, I think it started like with uh, my family, like they're very, they don't really like authority, my family, and they like to do things their own way. And so I think I grew up in an environment of badass people like that, that have the, that had this like ability to make shit work. Like 
see, like have an issue, but be like, well, we'll just do this. <laughs> and like, um, I think I grew up with that, like that attitude, like, like just do it, like figure it out, you know? And so, and also I was lucky enough to be raised in an environment where people constantly told me as a kid that I was a natural born leader or I was a leader, um, like, you know, mm. on the report cards or whatever, or they talk to your parents at parent teacher conferences and they would be like, Jennifer is a leader. That's my birth name. And, um, there, and so I think that kind of got into my head and then like allowed me to believe in myself that I could be a leader one day. And I had big plans. Like I was like, I'm going to be the president. I'm going to change the world. And I just really felt limitless at a time, at a a certain Mm. time in my life, like before I found all this stuff out and, um, was just ready to take on the world. You know, I was just like, I don't really see the problem. Like, I'm just going to become president and fix everything. Like, it's not yes. that hard. Like, boom. <laughs> and so I was, I'm like, I think I'm naturally like an optimist too. So that's really helped me. Um, because when I found out I was intersex and I read the medical documents of what they did to me, which I need to say included a castration. So they removed my testes when I was one of that, uh, a clitoroplasty, a clitoral, clitorectomy and clitoroplasty when I was four years old, which is the removal of the clitoris tissue, the external clitoris tissue, and a vaginoplasty when I was 11, when they told me I was getting a bladder surgery, but they actually did a full out vaginoplasty and didn't tell me and didn't give me dilation instruction afterwards or dilators. So that is why I couldn't have sex with my, like why it was so hard to have sex with my boyfriend for the first time, because it went like four or five years after a vaginoplasty without dilation. And, um, so yeah, all that stuff happened. Um, and so, okay, so then I find this out and my first instinct is like, I'm not telling nobody. But then <laughs> I was just like, I'm gonna cover this secret up. I'm gonna swallow this. I don't want no one to know. I just wanna like, I just want this secret. I just wanna wake up from this nightmare and this not be real. And in the meantime, mm-hmm. I'm just, if it isn't a nightmare, I'm just not gonna tell nobody. Mm. Then I go to op- uh, my friend, the intersex person that spoke at my class, Linnell Stephanie Long, she was the speaker at my class, the first intersex person I met, the one that made me tell the world or say that I was intersex in public. Um, mm-hmm. She got invited to be on the Oprah show, the intersex episode of Oprah back in the day. And she invited me to be her guest in the audience. And I saw three intersex people on stage that day speaking their stories. And one of them, like I had a crush on before, you know, she even talked. And then after she was done talking, I was like, oh my God, I still have a crush on them. I actually have more of a crush on them. And there was like this moment where I was like, I could maybe do this. Like people wouldn't think I'm weird or all the things I had internalized about my body and about being intersex. I was like, wait, I like this person and I like them even more after knowing that they're intersex and knowing their story and about and stuff. So that was a turning point moment for me was seeing myself represented kind of on Mm. TV, well, like pre-TV, like the recording of something that would be on TV Um, and realizing that like, I still admired those people that told their stories, my like similar story to mine. So, but nothing really happened. You know, I was just like, that was just an internal moment. But then thankfully women and gender studies, women and gender studies was very, a beautiful place for me to find myself as an intersex person and I decided to do my first thesis my undergraduate thesis on being intersex and I got to interview intersex activists who started the movement um and interview just intersex people and learn their stories put it together in a thesis and then I shared like a six I think we had six minutes to share our results and my family was in the room and all my classmates families were in the room and it was the first time I publicly shared my story and the story of others And I was so angry at that point. Like, I was, like, cussing and talking about fucking. I was like, they wanted to make the hermaphrodite fuckable. And I was just, like, screaming. And my yaya was like, what? Oh, my God. My grandma was just like, (laughs) like, your language. (laughs) And I was just like, Uh -uh. and I was just going off. (laughs) So, and then slowly after that, people just started asking me, "Give can you give a talk at this school? Can you give a talk? And then I was like, okay. And then... Uh, over the years it just kind of became my gig like I was just like oh okay this 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 makes this could make decent money and change the world at the same time let's go like you're supposed to do work that's good and work you love 
But um, so eventually, I think because there wasn't that many out intersex people that were young and inter- internet savvy and social media savvy and um, charismatic. I've been told I'm charismatic. Um, and so I think that you very much are me to become a like figurehead in the intersex uh, world because there's not many of us out there doing this work or at least there wasn't um there is now thank god um so that's kind of how that trailblazer oh my god that's that was my high school mascot trailblazers yes blazers. very fitting so i'd love to talk about a scene from your film a normal girl um we'll play a clip from it of a protest of a hospital that is performing surgeries on on intersex kids so we'll, we'll play this audio clip of the film and then i would love to hear more about it this hospital knows that intersex people exist but they refuse to believe that we can exist left alone in the bodies we were born with and that's why we're here demanding bodily integrity for not just intersex people but for all people And when we demand not to have surgeries forced on us, we're also demanding that people who are trans, gender non-conforming, or anybody else who wants surgery are able to get those freely and easily. No justice, no peace, no intersex surgery. No justice, no peace, no intersex surgery. No justice, no peace. So what is that scene and... and but I guess tell us a little bit more about the activism work that you do and, and what you were doing in that scene. Mm, so I co-founded a group called Intersex Justice Project with Linnell, the first intersex person I ever met, and another intersex person I met later down the line named Sean Seifel Wall. And we call ourselves IJP for short, so I'll just say that from here on out. Um, so in that clip you just heard, IJP was... I think it was our first protest at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago, which is the hospital that I had all that stuff done to me without my consent, like you beautifully stated earlier. Um, and we were protesting to end the surgeries there that are happening there. And I was very stressed out because I'm not good at delegating. And I wait till the last minute for I'm a procrastinator and I don't know how to delegate, but I have grand ideas and I want to do it all. And I also then want to do it all myself. I feel because that I'm like... on a deep level. <laughs> oh my goodness, that resonated way too much. Oh God, oh Lord. So that you did. know, anyway, this the part of that film that we just heard is like the culmination of all that stress of trying to plan a giant thing, like a, like organize a big ass protest, and I'm thinking like, what if no one's gonna come? What if no one's gonna show up? What if no one's there? What if like what if this is a bad idea? Maybe I shouldn't do the protest. Maybe no one's going to come tomorrow. And then it's, I'm going to feel so nervous and I'm going to feel so this and that. Just all the anxiety I thoughts. very, very deeply as well as an organizer. Yeah. Right? It takes years yeah. off. Every protest takes years off of our life. And it so, takes years off of your life, 100%. This is like the first protest that's happened in the United States on the streets for intersex since like 1996. Oh, wow. And that's the end of the clip as you hear the chanting and everything that we're doing out in front of the hospital. And so... Three or four years we fought that campaign. We did multiple protests and different things. Um, we had a we had a, a petition. But, you know, whatever. Like, nothing... They weren't changing their surgeries. They would just laugh at our... Pro- not laugh, but they would just come at our protests and hand out their statement to the PR. Like, the PR people would come out and hand out a statement to the media. And they would just look at us and be like, okay, bye. Like, we're going to keep doing our surgeries. And um, India got on Instagram last summer. Oh, because I saw that the department at Lurie that sees trans kids um, was posting all these pictures of Pose pose actors and actresses and Mm. on their page to be like, look, we're trans friendly. Ah." And Mm. I texted India like, look what they're posting. They got, they got like Pose people on here and they're still Hmm. doing surgeries on us. Um, For those of you who don't know, Pose is a show about ballroom culture and um, underground, the underground LGBT culture in 1980 and 1990 through the eighties and nineties. One of the, um, Lead actors of Pose, India Moore, who plays Angel, um, is like a trans person played by a trans person on a major network show. I'm actually with them right now. They're in the other room. And they're amazing. amazing. Yeah, they're amazing. And um, they really helped us with the, the campaign. They were like, oh, hell no. They didn't even tell me. They went on Instagram live in two seconds. And they were like, oh, hell no. Larry is not going to use my image 
to support their bullshit. Like you, they said, you cannot step on trans people's necks. No, you cannot step on intersex people's necks to uplift trans people. Um, and like tagged like celebrity friends like Jamila Jamil and um, um, some other people. Like, uh, 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 oh my God. I'm so bad with names. But anyways, celebrities. And then they started sharing our, our demands and shared our change.org um, petition. And all of a sudden, we got like 10,000 signatures overnight. And we got like um, all these celebrities telling Lurie, like, take my picture off your damn page because I don't support intersex surgery, da 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 And I was like, ah, this is amazing. And then um, like within a week or two, this trans person who I'm friends with from Chicago, who's also a rock star and a doctor like they literally are a rock star. like they play guitar and then they're also a doctor and anyways they work at Lurry and they they pub they've been to our protests but this was the first time they publicly stated on social media that they can't no longer stay silent as an employee of Lurry while while intersex kids are getting harmed and i got chills up and down my spine because i knew that that was monumental because I, there had never been a moment where um staff at a hospital have spoken out at a children's hospital spoken out about the surgeries and then after she did that her name is dr ellie kim after she made that post on twitter like five more people came out that worked at lurie and i was just like oh my fucking god and then like it all happened so fast we were gonna have this meeting and then it didn't happen and then before it even happened the CEO got involved of the hospital, came down to the trans department and the intersex surgery department and told the heads of those two departments, make this go away quick, like make this stop, like all this media attention and all this, this stuff that's happening. I want like a resolution. And then within like 48 hours, we had an email. Well, first I got a phone call from a state representative who also tried, who helped us with the campaign, a, a queer woman who works in Illinois state legislator named Kelly Cassidy. And she had written them a letter with her queer caucus. She wrote Lurie a letter. And she called me crying. She's like, we did it. It's over. They're ending the surgeries. And I was like, oh what? My God. And I was like, ah. You won. And crying. Yeah, she's like, we did it. Oh, my God. Because they wrote her first before telling us. And then they wrote us a letter. And they told us what they were going to do. And, and I was like sobbing, ugly crying. Couldn't catch my breath. I was so happy. I, I was a release. Like, I felt chills. I felt like I was just crying. I couldn't stop because it had been... Since the day I found out I was intersex, right after that time I got my, my medical records, I was like, this shit needs to end. And I'm just going to share my story. And of course it'll end. Like, like, I thought I lived in this world where you just tell the world that really fucked up shit is happening and human rights are being violated. And then it would change. But I was like, right. no, that's not how it works, actually, because of power and oppression and structures and how it's institutionalized. Um, so that was just this big moment where I just felt so much a release and mm. yeah that's amazing i think we'll we'll end it on that um Yay. i do have one last question for you is are there any inner other intersex artists or activists yes, that we yes. should oh, know yeah. about and follow yes so i hope i can say this i think i can it's gonna be public soon my friend river gaio oh i just dropped something I hope I, I'm going to say, my friend River Gallo, G-A-L-L-O, um, created, wrote, and starred in the first intersex narrative film, feature film. No, not short film, but it's not a documentary. So it's like the first one written by an intersex person featuring intersex people. And just, okay, did this like a few years ago. It's called Pony Boy, P-O-N-Y-B-O-I, the film. But mm. two days ago, actually three days ago now. They were here last night. They told me this last night. Drake, the rapper, the GOAT himself has a production company. I forget what it's called, but they worked on Euphoria. If you watched Euphoria and you'll see like Drake's name on it. And I was like, what? Drake does films? So Drake's production company bought the rights or no, they optioned the screen, the script uh, this week. So we might have an intersex feature film because they rewrote it as a feature written by an intersex person, produced by Drake and others, coming to movies, theaters, one day soon. So that's that's this beautiful media representation that's gonna happen. They're also brown. There's, uh, I don't wanna fuck it up. I think they're Salvadorian. Yeah, they are. They're fucking amazing. Um, they're beautiful. They're also like a gorgeous model. Uh, and so that's someone I would say to follow and watch out for is River Gallo. Um, 
who else is out there doing the thing? Um, follow Intersex Justice Project. I'm no longer with IJP because I was trying to take a break to write my book. And I'm trying to like transition to other things in my life. But um, Intersex Justice Project on Instagram and their website are, is full of great resources. Um, Sean Seifel Wall, follow him on Instagram. He's the co-founder of In Intersex Justice Project. Hans is another one to watch out for. Hans is writing a graphic novel. They're intersex, H-A-N-S. They use Hans as a pronoun. Hans is writing, I've known Hans since they were like 15. And they're like, they're amazing. Um, you might know them from YouTube. They have YouTube videos with pink hair. They have Instagram and they're, they're working on a graphic novel because they're an amazing um, illustrator. And... Those are the, the ones that come to the top of my head right now. Um, awesome. And for everyone listening, we'll include all of Pigeon's recommendations in the show notes. Last but not least, when is your book coming out and where can people go to read it? Good question. Mm -hmm. um, it's slated to come out at the end of this year, but our editor got pregnant during the pandemic and decided to have a baby. So it got like kind of pushed a little because she's off of work for a few months. <laughs> go you. I'm happy for your baby. Yes. But um, so I think I have a gut feeling it's going to be the early next year. So um, or sometime next year. So 2022, I'm thinking I'm um, pretty much at the sixth chapter right now. And I think we're only going to have 10 chapters of the draft, the first draft. So, yeah. And then it's going to be published and it's going to be an audiobook. We're going to do a, um, I think there's already a deal with Audible built into the contract and you know, Amazon, you can get it. You could get it at your local bookstores. You could probably just get it anywhere. I don't know yet because it's not out yet, but um, it's going to be everywhere. Shout and out what's Topo. What's it called? Uh, there's no name. TBN, to be named. It's called TBD. <laughs> to be determined, yes. Actually, that's to be a determined. Funny name. Yeah, that's kind of like a great name. Um, but shout out Topo because they are the um, publisher. Topo also did Transparent, that show that I was on for like a minute. And they have publishing now, so they gave me the opportunity to write a book with them. Amazing. Thank you so much for all of the work you do for intersex folks, for sharing your story. Oh, can um, I say for, one for more thing? To... Yeah, of course. So this is a new thing in my life. I'm going to be on this new platform called Sunroom. Um, it's kind of like an Instagram meets OnlyFans. Um, but so y'all mm -hmm. could follow me on Sunroom, hopefully by the time this comes out. Um, look for Pigeon, P-I-D-G-E-O-N. Um, I'll be on Sunroom and you can get exclusive content from me there, like uh, resources about intersex, videos, uh, tips, intersex excellence, people, other people to follow, other intersex artists and creatives to follow and resources. So it's called Sunroom. Amazing. Well, there you go. All of this will be in the show notes. Pigeon is just, <laughs> there's so much we didn't get to cover because Pigeon has done so much, has made so much, has dabbled in so many mediums that we just cannot cover it in an episode. So thank you so much for your excellence, um, for all of the work that you do and for your art. And I hope to one day be able to finally meet you in person after admiring you from afar. For all, for pretty soon. I'm gonna see you pretty soon. It's so glad, I'm so okay. thankful for you having yes. me. You're doing all the things. I love it and I'll see you soon. Take care of yourself. Thank you. Bye boo. Thanks for listening to this episode of Lavender You. Our show is produced by Goal 17 Foundation, and our theme song is Love Line by the one and only Zolita. We release new episodes every other Thursday, so make sure you like, rate, and subscribe on Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever it is you get your podcasts. And follow us on social media, too. We are at Lavender You Pod. That's Y O U on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you're a queer person out there who's just feeling alone or sad or anxious or like no one in the world understands what it's like, know that you are not alone. Lavender U is a community of people who love and accept you, and our DMs on social media are always open if you need to talk. Send us a message anytime. We are here for you. See you next episode, and until then, long live the gays.